Greetings, Church. I thank the opportunity to share from the Word today. Let's all turn to 1 Kings chapter 10. I'm going to read from 23. 1 Kings chapter 10, verse 23 onwards. Thus, thus King Solomon excelled all the kings of the earth in riches and in wisdom. And the whole earth sought the presence of Solomon to hear his wisdom, which God had put into his mind. Every one of them brought his present articles of silver and gold, garments, mares, prices, horses, mules, so much year by year. I think we are really familiar with this character of Solomon. Yesterday for the young group, I, we were trying to create an ideal, successful person of the year. So we listed all the characteristics. He should be a very good businessman, very influential, uh, very rich, wealthy. And then we looked at Bible and so who actually qualifies for all these characteristics. And we found Solomon. He was rich. He was wise. Right? If you take today's status, right, you have like creative people who are wealthy and there are so many very wealthy people who may not be that creative, but if you put Solomon's wisdom and his influence and how much he influenced the world at that point of time, there was no one like him. And here the author is saying he excelled all the kings of the earth. There is nothing more. Right? He's at the top of the world. And he had wisdom. He had wealth. And I was reading uh, in, in the historical documents the buildings that he made and the description that we read, people are even thinking, where did he get all these wealth? Because it was unimaginable. And that is, we know that that's because God had blessed him in that way. But he was at the top of the world, and that's what we read. I also read that he was able to actually realize to the fullest potential all the economic possibilities that was there in that land. You know, he was wise, so he made Israel right in the middle, where if you have to go to Egypt or Mesopotamia, it's Israel in the middle, so he used trading. And he made a lot of money politically from that. So he was wise, he was, a very, very, good, he was very good in that, in that sense. He was not a warrior, but he didn't have to fight any war because God gave him peace at that time. So a person who has been, he's at the top of the world. And one thing we also ask this, if, you, if your prayer is like that, what you will end up is you will be like Solomon, right? If you're praying for your studies, if you're praying for your career, if you're praying for more wisdom, everything, finally you will get Solomon. There cannot be anything more than that. That's all that you get, right? So when we look at Solomon's life, he was the most successful person in the eyes of the world at that time. And that is what this portion is. And later, if you continue reading in, first, in chapter 10, 26, you know that he acquired horses and chariots and all those things which showed his military strength he had. So he was, he was good or very strong in most of his ways. And we know there was people who were burdened this process of Israel. They had a lot of uh, tax things that he, he had imposed because of the projects he did. He did a lot of construction projects. And that is one way to say, you know, to show off, you know, how rich you are. So it's like, you know, you'll have like three Lamborghinis and three Ferraris on your driveway that shows who you are. Just like Solomon built at that time, they didn't have that. So they built buildings. You know, there were so many projects that were happening. And everyone who saw, you know, said, oh, you are, you are so rich and, you know, you have a magnificent kingdom. And that's why the queen came just to see, just to see somebody came to his kingdom. And that was a state that Solomon had. And how about his faith? When we read First Kings chapter 8, 15 to 21, this is a place where uh, he's actually asking God. And this is a prayer that he does. And in chapter 8, from verse 15, if you read, he says, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who with his hand has fulfilled what he promised 
with his mouth to David my father saying since the day I that I brought my people Israel out of Egypt I chose no city out of all the tribes of Israel in which to build a house that my name might be there but I chose David to be over my people Israel now it was in the heart of David my father to build a house for the name of the Lord the God of Israel but the Lord said to David my father whereas it was in your heart to build a house for my name you did well that it was in your heart nevertheless you shall not build the house but your son who shall be born to you shall build the house for my name solomon exactly knew what happened in the life of david he knew the faithfulness of god in david's life he knew what was happening he knew the history or in other words i would say david did a very good job of telling him all that happened to him and he was very clear in his instructions or in, as, as deuteronomy says teach your children your ways i think david was shared with solomon and he was well aware of the ways of the lord in the life of david so he knew what, what his god about god's faithfulness in the past another thing as we were reading he knew what his purpose was he knew why god chose him why he is building this temple and why god has put you in that situation and he knew the purpose that he god had for in his life and he knew we know the temple dedication prayer isn't it it is such a beautiful prayer and it it talks about the f- covenant faithful you know we're not going to read it but it talks about the covenant faithfulness of god and it says oh if somebody sins if they come to this temple they can receive forgiveness from the presence of god so he knew all this he knew the covenant faithfulness of god he knew there is a forgiving god there's always restoration in his kingdom uh, in his presence and you can come to him he knew that and not only that he had a very good heart initially when uh, when he prayed god said ask me what you want and what did he say i want wisdom and it is it is so nice and what what actually what the lord says to him back in as you come to first kings chapter 3 verse 10 it says it pleased the lord that solomon had asked this it please the lord that solomon had asked this he asked for wisdom oh god you put me in this situation i know what my purpose is but give me this wisdom to execute this and god says it pleased and and in rom uh, first kings chapter 3 if you go a little up in verse 3 it says solomon loved the lord walking in the statutes of david his father only he sacrificed and made offerings at the high places because they didn't have a temple at that time but solomon loved the lord now the whole disaster comes in first kings chapter 11 just now we read solomon loved the lord and when it comes to chapter 11 and verse 2 uh the the second part or i'll start from verse 1 now king solomon loved many foreign women along with the daughter of pharaoh Solomon loved the Lord and now it says Solomon loved the foreign women and it goes further if you go to chapter 2 uh, sorry verse 2 in first uh, kings 11 it says the second part Solomon clung to these in love he clung to these in love and i have been trying to think how can a person who was successful in this world who in our terms we would say a very good christian business ruler or a business monarch or a ceo or a person who is good in business who is smart who is creative who is who knows the bible who was first in jbq who came first in tbq in all that how can this happen to this person at the end and that is we don't we get only the details in this chapter that he actually gave his heart to something else and when we when we read further it says for verse 4 for when heart when when solomon was old his wives turned away his heart after other gods and his heart was not wholly true to the lord his god it was not wholly true to the lord his god that means he had a divided heart or a conflicting heart it is like half hearted and remember 
to, 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 to emphasize further, the author says in verse 9, and the Lord was angry with Solomon. And see that qualification. But his heart had turned away from the Lord God of Israel who had appeared to him twice. So there was nothing wrong. In it. So when, when we think about this divided heart in Solomon's ways, I have made this temple. And imagine his temple is just shining and everybody is worshiping. Everybody is happy. Everything is good. The, the people are happy. We got the best kingdom. So Solomon is now coming into this picture and actually he's playing two roles here. He is doing everything in the church and he is also every, doing everything in the world. There is world in him. There is also God in him. That's what he thought. That's what he thought. But one observation we also make when we look at Solomon's life is if we go to First, cha First Kings chapter 6. Chapter 6 verse 37 it says in the fourth year the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid in the month of Ziv. And in the 11th year, in the month of uh, Bol, which is the 8th month, the house was finished in all its parts according to his, all its specifications. Remember there, Solomon did a very good job in building that temple. It was exactly, exact like the specification what was given. He was 7 years in building it. He took 7 years to build this temple. And let's go to chapter 7. Solomon was building his own house. 13 years and he finished his entire house. He took almost double the time to build his own, time, his own house than the temple. Now, looking at the, uh, uh, the, the, the spec, probably historically, this temple was something inside the complex of the palace. But what we see here is he took double the time for building his own town. He did build the temple. It was according to the specification. He did it well, but he also did many things well. His own house, and what is his house for? We will read that he wanted to bring Pharaoh's daughter, who was his wife, to put them in this house. At that time, when we think about, you know, if he had 700 wives and all that, it is, it is not just about the relationship. The wife was also more of a political relationship with the other kings. So Pharaoh gave his daughter to him. And he also gave a city. In our language, it's a dory. Right? He gave us a gift. It was not very common, but he did that because he wanted to do a relationship. So this, this, the, the, this relationship, everything is all also about his alliance with other kingdoms around him because it's, it also has other benefits into it. it. And the Bible doesn't condemn what he did at this point. But my argument is he had already set his heart on things. It is not just because he wanted to build a temple he did perfectly. There are so many things he did it and he did in that way. He took double the time to build his own house at that point. God is pleased with the temple. But we see the exact downfall in chapter 11. But I think he always had this dividing heart. And where did that come from? I think this conflicting heart comes from a comfortable heart. That means Solomon did build all these things. And what did it cost him? It did not cost him anything. Because he, God gave so much riches. And if we read in First Chronicles, at the end, when David is offering or giving the instruction in First Chronicles chapter 29... David, once, once he's handing over this, David had this temple building thing project in his mind and God said, don't build it. But David did not just give it to him. He had provided everything for him. If you come to First Chronicles chapter 29, verse 2. So I have provided for the house of my God so far as I was able, the gold for the things of gold, the silver for the things of silver, and the bronze for the things of bronze, iron for the things of iron, wood for the things of wood, besides great quantities of onyx and stones for sittings, uh, antimony, colored stones, all sort of precious stones and marble. David already did a majority of his work and provided for Solomon. Solomon only had to just manage it and execute it, and God gave him the wisdom, and he did it. 
He had so much wealth already, and God also helped him to build that. He did not really have to pay much, but he was, all, he was always having this conflicting mind in his heart. He was going over or, or, you know, for the temple to show the projects and everything that he had. He had so much wealth, and he was always going through that. In the Bible, we don't see a conflicting heart is not something that God accepts. In, in, in Matthew chapter 11, um, not 11, Matthew chapter 6, we don't have to read. We know very a portion where it talks about putting our treasures in heaven. And after that, it talks about a parable. Uh, Matthew chapter 6. Uh, let me go there. Matthew chapter 6, 19, it talks about do not lay your treasures. And then in chapter, verse 24, it talks about no one can serve two masters. And it talks about God and mammon, God and money. God, God is a person, money is an object, but what we see there is the money is personified as a slave owner. That means it's saying you cannot serve two masters. If you're serving money, if you're serving something else other than God, you are a slave to that. You cannot be a slave to God and something else. Or in other words, God plus something else is nothing. You are lost to both. There is no Solomon thought, I am doing all these things. I have done all these things. I, am, I know all these things. So, and I can also have whatever in the world that I can do. And God says, no, you can serve only one thing. And it is very clear, if you read, there's a parable in between. Matthew chapter 6, 22 and, uh, till 23, there's a parable in between. And many of us think, oh, that is a misplaced parable. What does that have to do with the things above and before? But that exactly is a parable. It talks about I is the lamb of the body. And if your eye is, uh, is not right, your whole body becomes dark. That means it is our perspective that is making us who our master is. Or in other words, simply, Christianity is very digital. It's only one and zeros. There is no 1.5, 2.5. It's not analog. It is either one or zero. Either you serve God or you serve something else. There is nothing like, oh, I can do part of this here and part of this here. It, you cannot have a conflicting heart in the presence of God. That is not acceptable to God. That's why when the sacrifices were given, you had to give the best fully. There is no sacrifice like the lame a lamb or something that, you know, that is not good. God does not accept that. He can take a broken heart if you give fully, humbly, but he cannot give. He doesn't take something that we partly give. Here it says, you cannot serve two masters, Solomon. You did everything for me and you think you can, you can also serve the things of this world and that doesn't work this way. And when we look at David, David did pay the cost that he wanted to. And we know uh, when we go to First Chronicles chapter 29, he, he, had, he had secured all these things and in addition he says in verse 3, Moreover, in addition to all that I have provided for the holy house, I have a treasure of my own of gold and silver because of my devotion to the house of my God. I give it to the house of my God. This is my own gold, but I'm going to give it to you because you are so significant in my life. I want to just build and worship you. I want to just give everything that I have for your glory and I'm going to give it. We know another occasion where uh, First Chronicles 21, 24, it says, somebody was saying, oh, you don't have to offer anything for this place. I'll just give it to you. And David says, I don't want to offer a sacrifice that costs me nothing. I don't want to offer a sacrifice that costs me nothing. And that was Saul, David. But here when we see Solomon, Solomon served God out of his abundance. It did not cost anything for him. He never saw any lack. He never saw any war. Now probably all these things added up and he thought, oh, there is God in my life. There is world in my life. I'm giving to God. And the accounts you see, oh, this is Solomon's temple. 
This is Solomon's worship. Look how much God has blessed him. But Solomon was inside enjoying the world. And also he thought, oh, I'll just give to God what, it, what, we want, what, what he needs. And that is good enough. I want to draw our attention to another parable that Jesus talks about. And before that, there's a reference of Solomon in the New Testament. In Matthew 11, he talks about the Pharisees came and said, hey, show us a sign that you are the Messiah. And Jesus says, you're not going to get any other sign but the sign of Jonah. And he says, the queen who came to see Solomon is going to condemn you because they came to see Solomon's wisdom, but the one greater than Solomon is here. And you, are ne you have neglected him fully. His point is, you're seeing those wisdom. You're not realizing who I am. You don't understand my significance and you don't care about me. You have lost the significance you don't understand. And the greater Solomon is here and we are not understanding. And what happens when you see this greater Solomon? And that's what we read in Luke 7. We know the story, very famous story. I don't know how many bands we have named after this, the alabaster jar, the songs that we have named about. We know about the hero of that story, the sinful woman, because sinful, maybe the society labeled her sinful. She comes and what does she do? He, he has, she has this perfume which is very expensive. And she was a sinful woman. She cannot afford much, but all she had, she just bought this perfume and poured it on the feet of Jesus. And she was standing there and she was weeping. And, and, the, and, the, and I was reading that the word that is used for this weeping is not, it's not just a whimpering. The word that is used is for rain. She was just overwhelmed at the presence of God because she couldn't call, hold to herself what God had done to, to her. And there was forgiveness that she received. And, God, and she just poured it out onto him. And that is what David did. He gave up everything for him because he knew the value of God in his life. And this woman, he knew what God had done to her. And this is a story where the hero is unnamed. We don't know her name, but we know the villain has a name. His name is Simon. And God is asking Simon a few questions. In Luke 7, verse 44, Do you see this? Woman, I entered your house, you gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. What is Jesus asking Simon? Simon, have you responded or have you given up everything that you could for me? Do you really understand the significance of the Messiah and have you responded in that way to him? And you see that he, he, he has just invited Jesus. Did Jesus come into his house? Yes. Did Jesus eat from his house? Yes. But he was never adored. He was just a teacher to him. And he, he was in his part of his story, but he was never the hero of his story. But that woman, he gave, she gave everything she could to worship God. And there was a cost that she paid. And this Simon, he didn't have to pay much. It was a, it was a usual practice that people are invited. She didn't, he just gave in from his abundance what he could give to the Lord. And, and God is asking him, have you given, have you sacrificed enough? according to the significance of Messiah. And that's a question we also should ask today. Have we sacrificed enough in response to what Christ has done for us? Or are we serving God out of the abundance that we have? Some, sometimes we say, do it until it hurts. A sacrificial service of God. When you see, look at the cross, our response is give it all for God. No, you don't cal take a calculator and take 10% and it's exactly 10%. No, I'm good. 
you don't even consider that anymore because you look at the cross and he's, he gave it all for us. And that is our response that we would have to God. And that is what God expects. Simon was probably trying to test Jesus or try Jesus. But the woman completely gave everything she had for God. That was not a conflicting heart. That is a whole heart that this woman gave. Simon gave part of his heart to Jesus. Solomon had a divided heart. And that is the question that we need to ask. And towards the end, I believe Solomon probably wrote Ecclesiastes towards the end. And maybe he came back to God because he knew there was a God who, who accepts. And Ecclesiastes 12, 13, and 14, this is what he wrote. Now all has been heard. Here is a conclusion for the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the duty of all mankind. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. And his message is, fear God. Fear God. Though he had multiple encounters with God, I think he took it casually probably. He did not. He may probably had a hear, a fear, but his, his divided heart could not sustain that fear for God. It is not continuous. The fear of God is so important for us to appreciate what God has done. Ephesians 2, we know that we, are, we have been given a label. We, we are told we are the objects of wrath waiting. And then God saved because of his character. But only if we understand this awe in his presence, the, the fear or how the holiness of God, we can really appreciate the salvation that God has given. If you do not, we will take it casually. We will serve him out of our abundance. It doesn't really matter. Just go to church. Just do it. It's not, it's not taking anything from me. There is no cost that I need to pay for serving Christ. And that is the kind of culture that we live in. Nobody likes to talk about the fear of God. But the Bible is packed with the awe and the fear of God as we were singing. I want to read Hebrews chapter 12. Verses 18, uh, verses uh, 25 onwards. See that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape if you reject him who warns from heaven. This is not Old Testament warning. The warning still stays. He is a consuming fire. And when we understand this, realize, when we realize how, how severe this sin is, how severe the punishment is, how great God is, how holy he is, only then we can ap appreciate this escape path, the salvation that we have. And that's why it says at the end, to verse 28, there is, therefore let us be grateful. We were afraid, we were scared, we were in fear. Now we are grateful. Because he showed us mercy for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Thus let us offer to God an acceptable worship. How? With reverence and oh, because he is still God and he is still the consuming fire. Many a time we have lost this view of God. And therefore our sacrifice has stopped. We are giving part of our life. Whatever is left we give it to God. Solomon had so much, he just gave it to God what was left. It didn't even make a dent in his kingdom. He was still rich. Silver had no value in his kingdom because it was so much. So the temple was just one of his projects. In our life, if God is just one of our projects, let me tell you, you have a divided heart. And we are not serving God and mammon. There is no concept like that in the Bible. We can serve only one master. And we have to decide who our master is.